So, hi everyone. Um, so today I'm not going to talk about scikit-learn, but more about a recent trends uh, in applied machine learning, which is the uh, move to neural networks for building recommender systems. Um, so first, let's talk, let's talk a bit about uh, recommender systems. Um, so the, the canonical example of recommender systems is uh, product recommendations. So for instance, uh, on an Amazon website, if you uh, pick up a, uh, a, a book, if you go on the page of a specific book, so this is the Scikit-learn book by Andreas Muller on machine learning, uh, automatically uh, Amazon will generate uh, two uh, groups of uh, recommendations, one for stuff to put in, uh, in addition to your basket and another group for additional books you might be interested in uh, if you want to change your mind. Uh, so here the, the goal is clear, is just to uh, increase the sales, to do up sales and so on. Uh, it's also used for recommending media, for instance on a streaming, uh, music streaming platform such as Spotify. Uh, you have an input in green which is my profile and uh, as an output the recommender system will generate a playlist that is tailored to my uh, listening habits but it's making it possible to discover new music because uh, none of those uh, bands there, uh, I don't know any of them, but there is a good likelihood that uh, it's actually a good playlist uh, when I w uh, go to work. Uh, so here the goal is to reduce UI friction, to simpli simplify uh, navigation, and so to do increase uh, user retention on the platform, but also to hide holes in the catalog, because suppose if you had only the search engine uh, as a UX, as a user experience to access the content, uh, it might happen uh, from time to time that uh, when I type the name of a band, uh, it's not in the catalog and then I'm disappointed. If, if you, you push stuff that are more likely to, to suit my taste, uh, then you, you can effectively hide this by reducing the, the occurrences of such uh, disappointment. So it's actually good for increasing uh, uh, the revenue of the platform as well. And other applications of, uh, of a recommender system that is not as trivial is actually search engines. Uh, nowadays, search engines, uh, when you, you do a query, uh, for instance on Google, you have two inputs. You have the, the keywords that you put in the search field, and you also have your, your personal account because you're logged in most of the time. Uh, and then you get the output, uh, the, the, the web pages that both match your profile and the keywords. And in that case, uh, the keyword is Python. And what I get as the first result is not the animal, it's not the snake, it's the programming language. And actually, if you scroll down, uh, there is no snake at all on that page. Uh, so uh, it's really, really personalized. And the second, uh, um, the second uh, recommender system that you get on that page is actually the ads. Uh, it's also uh, personalized uh, uh, based on, on your clicking a bit. Uh, so this is really important from a business point of view because this is uh, the, the main source of revenue of uh, two of the largest uh, global companies in the world. So you can see that um, uh, recommender systems nowadays have, have a, a really, really big impact. And I didn't speak about personalizing uh, uh, social network uh, status messages like in Facebook or uh, Twitter and so on. Um, so let's talk a bit about the concepts uh, behind recommender systems, now that we know what they are good for. Uh, as we've seen previously, there are two kinds uh, of uh, recommender systems uh, based uh, on the input data that we feed to the system. Uh, first, there are content-based uh, uh, systems uh, that take a description of the user, uh, like it could be the uh, age, the gender, the uh, geographical location, and a uh, description of the item, like metadata, for instance, if it's a movie, the, 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 the uh, words that appear on the title, uh, the, the picture of the cover of the movie, or the, uh, the name of the director, the publication date, uh, the language of the movie, and so on. And uh, there is another way to, another kinds of input that you can use, is the, uh, not the description of, of the items, but the interactions uh, between users and uh, items. In that case, we just uh, represent the users and uh, items as integers, identifiers, uh, in the catalog and uh, the user base, and we just count the number of times one user is interacting with one item. And the kind of interactions can be of several kinds. They could be stars, number of plays, number of likes, number of comments, number of clicks in a search result, and so on. Uh, so in that case, we aggregate a lot of uh, data based on the user activity, basically. 
Uh, finally, there are also hybrid systems uh, that kind of uh, mix and match the two kinds of input into the system. And this is interesting because typically when you have a new item, uh, a new movie for instance, uh, you don't have any clicks on it yet, so you are not able to recommend it. So in that case, we have the cold start problem, so it's good to use the description of the, the name of the director to make a good prediction, uh, to, to recommend it to the right users. Um, uh, but uh, once uh, uh, a movie or a user gets a, a lot of activity, uh, you get a lot of uh, data and it's good to leverage it and then collaborative filtering tends to, to yield higher performance. There is also two kinds of targets. Uh, one is explicit feedback, where you have uh, negative or positive feedback and something in between, for instance, when you give ratings using stars. And the other one uh, is implicit feedback. In that case, uh, you don't ask the user to, to give an explicit feedback because it's too costly, it's a pain of, in the user experience. Uh, but you just record whatever is happening and you consider that all the clicks and all the interactions between a specific user and an item are, are positive. You can filter out some negatives, like for instance, when a user sta starts to listen to a song and stops uh, 10 seconds after the start, uh, then you can remove that as a positive, but uh, you keep all the other events as positive uh, feedback. And in that case, you can use, uh, evaluate the quality of your prediction by ranking uh, items and making sure that positive items are ranked uh, uh, above uh, the negative items that are sampled at random in, in the database, all the other items. So the traditional way to do uh, collaborative filtering is to use a mathematical model which is called matrix factorization. You have a big sparse matrix of the, all the data, which is called R in this diagram. The rows of this matrix are the users, description of the users, the columns are the description of the items, and the entries are the ratings or the number of plays uh, for a specific user for a specific item. And so one user will, will see only like less, less than 10% of your catalog or buy 10% uh, of your product, otherwise you're, you're very lucky. Uh, so th this matrix has a lot of missing entries. And so to, the, the goal is to predict the values for the missing entries, and we can do that by doing um, uh, uh, the product of two smaller matrices that are actually the model parameters, U and V, and they are d-dimensional space uh, to represent the users and the items, and by doing the dot product of two, uh, one row and one column, you get an estimate of uh, the, the ratings. And you can obtain the good values for those parameters by minimizing a loss function using gradient descent, uh, like least squares, uh, using a, a stochastic gradient descent, and, and so on. So this is the traditional way to do it. If we want to use neural network, uh, we have a problem because we are, uh, the, the input is fundamentally, fundamentally integer identifiers for user and items. And so we will need the concept of embeddings. So here is the... The, the, the core of the database is a user number something interacted with item number something. If you feed those integers directly to a neural ne uh, network, uh, you would get nothing. Uh, it's just random noise. So you, you need to deal with those symbolic variables uh, to treat those uh, integers as symbolic variables and to find a good representation for them. So for recommender systems, this could be the item IDs and user IDs, but we have exactly the same problem for neural net when we try to deal with text tokens uh, for natural language processing, for instance, like characters, uh, words, and biograms. Uh, but it also happens when you have uh, any kind of categorical descriptors. Uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, tags uh, for your products, so it could be additional metadata uh, on your product in, your, in the catalog, or movie genres, director names, uh, the history of visited URL in the past, if you, if you track uh, the user activity to do a personalized uh, advertisement, for instance or skills uh, on a resume, if you are uh, like a LinkedIn or Viadeo, for instance, or uh, product categories, uh, and so on. So for all those cases, we have this uh, symbolic variable problem, and uh, we will use the same notation, we will use the, the symbol S in the vocabulary V. So uh, V is the set of all possible values, like the set of all possible um, item identifier in your catalog or the set of all possible words in the English language. So it's a very large collection of uh, discrete symbols. Uh, typically the cardinality is in the ten thousands to uh, several millions or sometimes billions. Uh, so the natural way to find a vector representation, a numerical vector representation for those symbols is to use the one-hot representation, one-hot one encoding. 
So if you want to encode the symbol salad, for instance, uh, what you can do is take all the words in the English language, in the uh, dictionary, and assign them a specific dimension. So you have one million possible dimensions, for instance, and uh, you would put zeros for all the entries, except for the entries for the dimension that matches the symbol salad, and you set it to one. So in that case, you get a very sparse vector, um, uh, that is discrete because the, the values are not contiguous, uh, continuous, they are 0 or 1, uh, in a very large dimensional space which has the size of the catalog or the vocabulary. Uh, each axis has a meaning a priori, uh, which is good because it's easy to interpret, but it's bad because it means that the distance between two uh, vectors taken at random is always the same, whatever the meaning uh, of the symbols that, are, uh, that have been represented that way. It means that, for instance, the distance between the vector that represents salad and the, the vector that represents carrot is the same as the distance between uh, salad and cake or uh, roof or pig or whatever. So, which is a problem because it doesn't really capture uh, the, the, the meaning of the, of, the, of the concept. So instead we might want to build vectors that encode the symbols into a continuous space that is a lower dimensional space with continuous values, not zero and one, but uh, positive negative values and uh, very rarely uh, zero. Um, so we want it to be continuous and dense. Uh, the, the dimensions in that space have no meaning a priori, and, uh, um, but we would like to have uh, those vectors, uh, the distances between those vectors to capture some, uh, some uh, meaning uh, relationship between the concepts. Uh, so this, uh, you can quantify this by computing the Euclidean distance or the cosine similarity between the, the vectors, or even just the dot product. Uh, so you can consider another way to see the embedding is to see it as a linear layer uh, in a neural network, typically as an input, uh, that will transform the one representation of the symbol into the continuous space, the, uh, the, lower, the lower dimensional continuous space. So, and you do this transformation by just multiplying by a matrix, uh, which is the, basically the embedding parameters. Uh, so W here, the matrix the, that, does, that defines the embedding, is actually initialized at random at the beginning. And uh, the entries of that matrix are part of the trainable model parameters. Uh, so if you want to do this in Keras, if maybe it's a bit too small, uh, but it's very easy, it's just another layer that you put in your model, embedding, takes uh, integers identifiers uh, for the symbols as an input, and they output a continuous vector uh, that are fed to the next layer. So how to train those parameters? Uh, we have to plug that layer in, in the model and define the loss function that depends on, on the target that we want to, to predict. And basically, we will get a trainable architecture and use gradient descent as usual to, to, to adjust the parameters of the embedding automatically end to end. So let's, let's talk a bit of, uh, about uh, architectures now. So if we take the uh, original problem, uh, of uh, predicting the number of ratings, the number of stars for, uh, uh, that a user i will give to item j in the catalog, what we can do is define two embeddings, two embedding matrices, uh, or two embedding layers that are uh, next to one another. One will take the integer id as the input and will output uh, uh, the embedding vector for, for that user i, and the other one will do the same for the, for the item. And uh, the model will make a prediction by just doing a dot product of those two vectors and will try to predict the, uh, the rating, the number of stars, for instance. Uh, so this works only for explicit feedback. And to optimize the model, to fine tune the model, we just need to minimize uh, the, the difference between that dot product and the true uh, number of stars that we, uh, we have observed in the data. So it's a, a least square problem. And if you see the mathematical formula, it's exactly the same as the matrix factorization problem. So it's just a, a neural network way to present an existing model. But why is, what is interesting in using a, a neural network uh, building blocks is that you have a lot more flexibility. Instead of just taking the dot product as the way to capture the interaction between the user and the item, what you can do is plug a, a uh, MLP with several layers, you just concatenate the two embeddings and then fit that to a, a fit-forward uh, multi-layer connected perception, fully connected perception. 
and uh, will you, that network will output the ratings, the number of stars. And you minimize the exactly the same loss function, but uh, this time uh, it's no longer the, uh, the dot product, it's the output of the network that you compare to the, to the ratings. And when you do that, you have a lot more flexibility because now the, the, the size of the two embeddings can be different. If you have a lot more items than users, for instance, you might want to have a bigger embeddings for the items. And furthermore, you can integrate uh, metadata ab about, above, about the users and about uh, the items and feed that into the network so that you have a hybrid uh, recommender system. And um, uh, what is also interesting uh, for this is that if some of the metadata is also categorical, for instance, the name of the director for a movie, you can also build a new embedding for the director names and a new embedding for movie genres and so on. And so you have many embeddings uh, as the input of the network, so you, can, you have a lot more flexibility than just a single matrix uh, factorization model. Uh, and furthermore, if you don't uh, have explicit feedback, you cannot use a regression loss as we did here. But what you can do uh, is uh, do a triplet architecture, for instance. So it, in a triplet architecture, you also have a user I that has seen a movie J, for instance. And what you do is you also pick up another movie uh, that we call K at random in, in the rest of the database. So it's very likely that it's a movie that the user has never seen and will never see in the future because there are so many movies and most of them are negative. Those are movies that we will never see. We are not interested in them. Uh, so you can contrast a positive movie with a negative movie for a given user. And so you compute the two interactions, by, for instance, in this case, by taking dot products, and you compute the difference between the two, and you want to make sure that the positive interaction between the user and the positive movie is larger than the, ne uh, the negative interaction between the same user and another random movie and you minimize that loss that will maximize that difference. And at the end, you will train the embeddings uh, of the model and, and make reasonably good ranking predictions. Uh, what is important here is that the, the V uh, embedding that embeds the items is actually the same for the positive and the negative, same, same matrix. We just take different rows uh, in that same matrix. So we train the same uh, model parameters. So the, the, those are shared or tied parameters. Um, and if you want to go deeper, uh, you can uh, do the same as we did previously, but uh, we replace the dot product by uh, a feed-forward um, uh, neural network. Uh, and here again, the, the parameters of the two networks are, are tied, and in that case, we call them um, Siamese networks. And uh, the, the loss function is very similar, and the whole architecture is called a, a triplet loss or a triplet network. Um, this is not the only way to deal with uh, um, uh, implicit feedback. And for instance, this is the architecture by uh, the YouTube team for making uh, video recommendations. And here you see that as an input uh, for a given user, you take all the embeddings of all the movies that uh, that user has seen in the past, or the videos that it has seen in the past. You take also le the embedding of all the keywords that you typed into in, in the in the, the search engine of uh, YouTube. You add additional metadata, uh, like uh, the geographic uh, location, the age, the gender of the person, and you feed that to a feed-forward uh, uh, neur uh, neural net. And the last layer of that neural net will, will basically compute a nonlinear embedding of, the, of uh, the user at a given moment in time, in a given context. And based on that, you can compare that to all the embeddings of the items and to try to predict the, the, the next movie that user is going to uh, watch. And by doing a gradient descent on that loss function, which is just a logistic, uh, basically, uh, the, the output is just uh, some kind of logistic regression, a log loss, uh, then you can uh, train all the model parameters, the embedding for the queries, the embedding for the, the movies, uh, and all the parameters of, of the intermediate model. So it's very powerful and it's, it's uh, very flexible uh, because you can mix and match many different kinds of data together, heterogeneous. So it's a bit of the philosophy nowadays to embed all the things. Uh, like discrete variables, you can use linear embeddings. Uh, images and sounds, you can use con convolutional neural network. Most of the time, in that case, you would like to use pre-trained uh, convolutional networks, for instance, on the album covers or, on the, as we've seen previously, on the uh, pictures of uh, locations if you sell uh, tr um, travels and so on. 
uh, sounds might be useful for st uh, for streaming, and that actually they have experimented with that uh, at Spotify. I don't know if it's in production or not. Uh, you can also do sequences of uh, discrete tokens with recurrent neural network. For instance, if you type a query, the order of words uh, might matter. So just doing an average of the, key the, the, the query keywords might not be a good idea. Maybe a, a, a recurrent net might be better or a convolutional neural net. Uh, and you can also embed like a uh, more um, structured uh, input, like for instance, uh, for molecules, you can take the graph representation of a molecule and use a graph uh, convnet to embed it into a vector space. And uh, obviously, we're not very interested in uh, recommending molecules, but uh, uh, it's just to highlight with that we have a lot more flexibility when we do that. And furthermore, we also uh, the deep learning ecosystem comes with a lot of additional tools like optimizers, like Adam, uh, re regularization mechanism like Dropout, and uh, many open source implementation that, that are very uh, easy to get started to, uh, to experiment basically on, on your data and to, to do this iteration. So my, my main point here is uh, uh, this deep trend to, to move toward deep learning tools it, it will give you a lot more flexibility to build uh, uh, recommender systems. Thank you very much for your attention.